this was a South African only session, but now we found out we got someone from Australia. Where are you from, Australia? I'm from Australia. Australia, where? Sydney. Sydney. So you got Sydney, we got Cape Town, we got Joburg. Where else? Melbourne as well. Coming. Coming. Hey. Anywhere else in the world? Australia. So those four cities, yeah. Yeah. Cool. What's the connection between Australia and South Africa? Is it that you're on the southern hemisphere? Yes. Yeah. That's the connection. So you can like phone your parents at the same time. What's the reason? I finished school at the same time. There we go. Yeah, yeah, because it's isn't it winter now in? Yeah, yeah I've, I've never been some in my whole life. I've never been. I've traveled a lot. So yeah, it's winter. That's cool. So we're going to do a course. Today's course is about intimacy. The whole day is a seminar on intimacy. I can see you had a, a class I, as I walked in on body image. You know, I hope that was good. We're not going to talk about body image, even though it's connected somewhat, because... How you feel about yourself affects how you're going to feel about the other person, you know? For me personally, this, this has been a really positive topic, very helpful. I taught here this whole past World Bonaire Cuba crew beginning in August until February, March. The war was pretty intense, but in fact we ended up having more classes because the guys, as I was saying before, weren't allowed to go out and do stuff. So they had to put up with me a bit more than they would have. But it was actually, we, we really grew as a crew. You can even ask the guys if you know any of them. We had a group called Intimacy Boys, like on WhatsApp. I never made it, the guys made it themselves. Yeah. And everyone was in the group. And, and that, for me, showed a lot. Of the boys went into it. One of the things that really made it work, and we're going to try to squeeze in like 20 sessions into you know, a very short amount of time, whatever we got, like an hour today. You, you got to like contribute as well, like I need to hear back feedback. First I'm going to say a little bit about what the course is about, like a sort of very short summarised version that will be helpful for everyone right now with their life, 2024 experiences, what we're dealing with. And then I want you guys to ask questions. I mean, we had some of the greatest questions asked. If anyone wants to check it out, you just go to Relationship Flow or Intimacy Boys or Unity Flow. And look up relationship or Bonet Cuba, type it in on Google and we'll come up, Eddie Goldsmith, under my name or under the world Bonet Cuba. And uh, we went into depth and some really wild questions were asked, and I don't mind. You can ask anything. Um, honestly, anything. So, yeah, have fun. Yeah, I wanted to ask. Um, okay, so here we are. So, I grew up in London, just to give background. I'm the UK representative that's not represented at here. But I, what I did do was step up in the world because I married a South African, you know? which you all, all will agree, it's even our Australian friends, the South Africans are a different quality you know, than the UK bunch. But uh, I'm biased. But before I got to marrying my wife, I grew up in Northwest London, very traditional, but not so religious, not really connected to Israel at all, very, very English. Like part of the establishment, you know, my family are big in the entertainment industry, and that was my upbringing. And I would say, if I characterize myself, remember this is the 90s, a little bit different to the 2000s. I was a bit more of a player than than I was like a kind of safe relationship kind of choice. You know, like I wasn't, I was not religious, no. So. I used to go to balls, I don't know if you had balls back in your, in, now in your days, but back in my days, balls were like where you basically hook up as many girls as you could in one night, yeah? That was the kind of like teenage experience I grew up with. And um, I went on tour, which was like the thing kids do at 16. That was my first trip ever in my life to Israel. I knew nothing about Israel most, because I went to reform, and for whatever reason they didn't teach me much about you know, my, my tradition, my, my heritage. I really didn't know much. Um, so I came here very naive, but one thing I felt like I was professional at, other than music, was women. So my image on, my, on the t-shirt, you know, you have like your summary of what your main theme was of the tour for a month with all your crew. 
My one was a guitar and a world and a tongue. So I figured that one out. So I went around, I did a world tour of all the women, which I literally did. And um, yeah, that was my tour experience in Israel. But something happened inside of me and it woke up a spark. When I came back to England around 16, I felt a bit empty after I left Israel. It didn't feel right, something was off. And I didn't know what it was, maybe it was because I was with so many cool people and I was missing that social experience that you guys are going to have after this ends. I don't know when it ends, but the power of being with a crew of people non-stop is very, don't take for granted. And that's going to be one of the points we're going to mention about relationship and intimacy. Having focused time with people, having ability to connect and have quality time with people. Like this is your, these kind of times in your life where you get to not have pressures of work and bills, and you get to actually be focused, or you, please go when you find your soul, soulmate, which we'll talk about. The idea of having someone to dedicate to is going to be a big theme in this like, little discussion we're going to have. I think it's the key to intimacy nowadays, and it's the hardest thing almost to do because of the way the world is. So back then, we didn't have all your, all your guys' distractions. Yeah? Think about it. What did I have? TV, a Walkman? It wasn't like the phones were in my face, and I didn't have a status. Like, I had it. I had a name, people knew who I was. I used to run nightclubs back then. That's what I was doing, 16, 17. I ran a, I ran a club called Pimson Horse. Literally, that was the name of the club. In Israel? In London. And um, my wife, to be, she was my VIP guest. Not that I knew that she, I was going to marry her, but we were very close. We met, first time in a gym, running around. I know I don't have the body image that we all aspire for, but back then I did. I used to model in those days. So I, 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 was run, I can show you pictures if no one believes. So, yeah. so you, can Google, you can Google it, no problem. Early Goldsmith, you can Google it now. I don't, I'm going to rather you're not on your phones. But the point is that I was running around the gym and my best friend introduced me and we became very, very close. We didn't actually hook up the whole time we were best friends, which was unusual for me. I think what happened, I just tell you a few nice, fun stories from 16 year old age. How old are you guys? 18. 18. So you, you could, it's not too far off, a few years back from you guys. So I was friends with some pretty upper class people in London who had high connections. So I ended up at Prince William's birthday party. Oh, I'm not joking. Was. Prince William. I came in with my boy, and my boy, him and my boy, we're still best friends. We could go anywhere and get whatever we want. That's how we felt. Like we had swag, we had money, we had. Looks, that's how we felt. He was blonde, I was brown. We like, get what we wanted, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, so now I went to Prince William's birthday and I saw this beautiful blonde girl <coughs> and we connected. And you know, she was a fancy, like, royal kind of woman, like Emily. You know? And she used to travel all the way from the center of London, which is like far to where I live, which is in the suburbs, where all the Jew crew are, like the Northwest London crew. And she'd come all the way, week after week, to come see me. Even when I went to university years later, she was still coming, to see, wanting to see me and send me letters and stuff. And, you know, that was for me a big wake-up call, because what was the, the point that happened? Once we were intimate, yeah, we'll call it that, I don't know if it was intimacy, but we, once we connected that way, what really affected me was that she wasn't Jewish. And I... It felt like something inside of me, like I felt when I came back from Israel that first trip, that emptiness. I felt that emptiness I've never felt before. Like so intense after I was with her. And yeah, we are going to have questions. Were you religious? I was not religious, no. Someone else asked this before, but you weren't here yet. So I wasn't religious, no. I was very like traditional, but not really, you know. Uh, so as one of my friends once said, I was about to kosher as a pepperoni pizza, you know, and that was like... You know, that was about pepperoni. You know, that was, that was where I was at. My family were not there. So um, my family were in the music business, you know, in the film industry. So I grew up going to, like, the best concerts. Everyone wanted to be my friend, yeah, obviously, because I could get you VIP to any show. Um, you know, just list anything in the 90s. I, could, I, would, I would probably went to it, and I could get people into it. And I met a lot of famous rock and roll musicians, famous people of that time. Yes? Do you go to Bon Of course. So you showed me. Of course I do. Anyway, so, um, anyway. Wow, yeah, he's talented. So, the point was that from the nightclub experience and from the Emily story, 
One of the things that also hit me after I did a night of nightclub, and it was packed. I had a thousand people at my clubs, made a lot of money. All my best friends came, and all my crew, and then larger crews, and I had a whole system how I promoted it. But I felt so empty afterwards. I even had three rooms of different DJs. It was a fat night, but I felt like an emptiness I've never felt since then. Because I think I didn't do that after I grew up a bit more. 17, 18, I started realizing that something didn't feel right. I started getting a bit more hippie stuff. Like, and maybe that's why by the time I met my wife, like in a real way, we did actually meet one time before this, shul hopping. Do you guys do that in, in where you live? On like Yom Tov, you go around to different shuls, see all the different yeah, social like scenes. So we used to do that. I didn't spend much time in shul, but so I definitely check out the scenes outside the shul. And my wife, that full team was introduced to me, but I didn't, you know, apparently she always fancied me, but I didn't talk to her until 16, and then we became very close. And in the meanwhile, I had like one or two other posh girlfriends from that, and other kinds of not posh girlfriends. If you listen to my classes with the intimacy boys, which I, I mentioned at the beginning, I went into all the stories. Like, I don't know if you heard of Magaluf, one of these Spanish islands. I was at one of those places, and it's like crazy what went down there. And um, you know, I got stories, a lot of stories. And I did this a lot when I was very young. I was, I was very sexually and, and busy with girls from a very young, young age. That was part of my like, James Bond focus. Yeah? Anyway, so now I come, I've got this feeling of emptiness, I've got to do something about it. So what, what do most people do when they feel empty? They fill out with drugs. Yeah? Sex, drugs, rock and roll. Yeah, that's usually how we deal with the empty feeling. But eventually that runs out. You don't feel, and even at a young age, I already felt like I really wasn't resolving it. And I had these memories of Israel resolving it. Experiences in Israel were going to do it for me. So I came back to Israel at 18 while I was at university. And I had some very spiritual experiences. And the good news was when I came back to come here for long term, actually I came one more time after that, my soulmate also was deciding at that time to also come to Israel and she ended up and funny enough we were like always like near each other like on tour she was like on the other group but we didn't know that we were soulmates then what happened was one time I think I was really high but I felt very grounded at that moment I was sitting under a tree playing some music in London in a park I used to play a lot of guitar and stuff and she was sitting there with me writing a poem or something or drawing pictures very arty and I looked at her and I said, I think we had like a connection like from another time. Like I feel really connected to you. And once again, we were never physical. Then, before, during, only until we got married. And I just felt like a really deep connection. Like I never felt like a person before. And she was like, I'm feeling it also. And it was really intense. And we talked about it a lot. And, we, and what happened was, thank God, like even though I was promoting clubs and some that, I lost my mobile phone, which had all the numbers and all the crazy stuff that I was busy organizing. I lost it, and I ended up with a new phone, and I only really put a few like very close people. And women-wise, she was the only woman I put on that phone. So it sort of like eliminated a whole load of noise. Yeah? And remember, it was not like social media back then. You can just go on, it, on the gram again, and you've got everything. Like once, it did, once you lost the phone, you lost the memory, you lost, you know. It's not like how it is now. You're always connected somewhere or another. You have the cloud and everything. So, once again, I come to Israel, and once again, you don't have a phone. You don't have all these things you're bringing with you from, from back home. So you just experience, this is what we're going to talk about a little bit. You experience the moment. You experience the now. You're able to open yourself to Israel, to the crew you're with. I ended up going to Swat, to Yerushalayim. She ended up soon afterwards coming to seminary. I went to Yeshiva. And we just kept like being, because I was very close to her twin brother. We, the way I met her twin brother was through, you know, heavy, heavy, like smoking, yeah? and, like purple haze, like crazy stuff. But then through her, we ended up seeing each other like at the cocktail for her family, and I ended up going for Yom Tov, and there was just this build up until I was 21, and I was like, this is it, she's the one. And that, in short, was a very long story condensed into a very short, like, sort of short session that we've got together today, where I basically felt a deep connection to this woman. I knew that she was the one, but I needed to go through like a cleansing period where I got a lot, eliminated a lot of the other noise, a lot of the other options, 
and just really home in on this one lady. And when I really felt like I was focused enough, I was able to look at her and see, yeah, she's the one. Like I had that feeling when I was in, under the tree years before. But at 21, I had this feeling that she's the one. And now it's a matter of, you know, just practicals of dating and getting eventually engaged, married and the whole thing. We got engaged to we were married kind of. Yeah, and I didn't know what all those significant what times meant before then, but by that point I'd learned a little bit about my people and heritage. So it was meaningful those times. Tuba Av is a time where you're meant to find your soulmate. And Hanukkah was, you know, the, we, we were married the second night, and every night it just got, as you light more candles, so did our Shevard rockets. So it got more light. And it was, our marriage has been like that. We've had six kids, thank God. We live in Israel. We're living right near here in the frat now, which was a big thing because we lived many years in Shulheim. And one of the things I needed to do was transfer a lot of my entertainment and music lifestyle skills from my past to Israel. So I've been involved all these years with booking artists, speakers. I'm in that space. I don't know if you've heard of any like Nissen Black or Willie Rothman or all these guys. I've been working with him for like since before he even became Jewish, 2011. We became friends. We worked the first show we did in 2013. And by that point he was Jewish. And 2000. So, I mean, I have a long list. You look up Unity Bookings, it's a long, long list of artists, speakers. You know, know. Probably Alex Clare. You know, Alex Clare. Um, just spoke to him yesterday. He's one of my known for long since, also since he first came to, back to Judaism pretty much and went viral. Um, I've been working with a lot, a lot of guys. Um, I don't know. You probably know a lot of them. Just look it up. You know, like Ari Lesser, you haven't seen that guy? He does all these hip hop things. Or, yeah, Rabbi Leo D is on my list, you know, like, I, I book all kinds of people. Yishai Fleischer was just on Piers Morgan the other day, so that's good for my business. The more they get, you know, exposure, the better it is. But the point is, so I'm, in, I'm coming from that world, the media world, and, you know, creators, artists, musicians. It's a very busy lifestyle. Like, if you get into management side of it, which right now I'm not, I'm more on the booking side, but when I was management, you're not home, yeah? So then your intimacy, your marriage gets, you know, starts to get challenged. That, that world is, uh, is a hard world to keep the focus. But the, what we're going to learn about where you guys are, you're not yet in the business world, is you're in this transition point of like school, like in between year off, to uni, to, to then. So there's going to be kind of, like I said, that, that was the main time where I found my soulmate. Now not everyone's going to be so lucky in that teen, late teens, early 20s, to already have some sort of awareness that this woman is the one, yeah? That's, that's quite rare, let's be honest, yeah? But one of the things what I needed to do to get to that sensitivity was to eliminate a lot of the noise. And that's part of what we're talking about with intimacy is the focus and the quality of the focus. Like, I'll give you an example, like, um, and then I'm gonna leave, open up the, the story for questions. Let's go a bit. Let's go a bit like hardcore crude, do you mind? You don't like to tell your mummy or something, yeah? yeah? Okay. Intimacy, yeah, if you think about it, yeah, it's this intense moment of pleasure, yeah, if any of you guys be involved, yeah? Now, really what it is, is you're bonding with another soul, you're bonding with another person in the most intimate way. That means intimacy. You're going into another human being to becoming, to know them, as it says in the Torah, but that's to know them, to know them in the most deep way. That's why it has the power to bring down children and to, you know, it has a creative power, it has so much energy there. The whole music world, the whole advertising world works off it, like you, you were all exposed to the energy of it, it's a power. Now, that power, if channeled and focused and is quality, is the most awesome power. Because one, it brings you marriage, Brings you means that what does marriage really mean? Loyalty. It means you're with someone you can trust and be loyal with. It means you know them deeply. Yeah? And it brings you to the potential of finding someone you can share your life with. Now, I don't know what it's like for your age group. I have kids similar age to you. I have an 18 year old. I have a 19 year old who's in, who's in Gaza right now. He actually just came out today. He's been in this whole war. So he's a, he's a year old, I suppose, than you guys. And he's, he was part of this recent rescue um, 
you know, the whole everything that you've seen in the news, pretty much, he's been one of the key players, his unit, and they've done some amazing, amazing things, and he's been given awards, and you'll probably get more as the war continues, and please hope be safe. He's coming home very proud of Barkas up at Masha. He's very, I'm very proud of my son, what he's done. So he, he's come to a point being in the war, his mindset, whereas, you know, when he was a bit of a younger teenager, even though I'm seemingly more religious, but like, my, my point in life is not about religion, my point in life is about helping people get close to God, get close to themselves, their soul level, the soul mate, that's why we're talking about intimacy here. So with my son, I'm not like crazy, he has to like be this crazy religious fanatic, but he does have to be connected to who he is. And that's one of the things going in this war has really laser focused himself to who he is. One of the reasons why, and this connects to the intimacy cause, is he has one, he hasn't been with any women, so it means he's more focused on getting to know himself, because you have to first know yourself before you can know another person. Second is, he does, hasn't had a phone most of the war. He's had no phone, no TikTok, no nothing, because they take it away from you, yeah? He only gets it back, like today suddenly I see him back online. He's, he actually did his first Instagram post on his, on his current account, because a lot of teenagers go through accounts, I don't know if you're familiar with that. They start an account, especially Israel, they start an account, close it, make another one, make another, I don't know why. Maybe they're ups and downs, they decide this, that, who the crew they're with, they don't want to be friends with those kind of people right now. Whatever the reason is, so the current account he's had for the last year or so, he hasn't posted any. I know he's now out of Azza because he's now posting again, and obviously from my wife, and I, you know, I see him, he's, I send him a heart and welcome back, and we're going to go get him later today. But the point is, he has decided that he doesn't want to mess around. He wants to find his soulmate, his partner, like he says, he looks at my wife and I, and he says, I want a marriage like you guys. I want to be able to find a soulmate. I want to find someone I can be dedicated with. And he's a young guy, like as you could think, well, maybe just saying. No, he's, he's felt what it's like to be on the edge of death. Like he's been in moments where bullets are flying around him. He's been in moments when, you know, Oketz, the dog, goes and booby trap blows up and wall falls down and he's got to run in the negatives with a machine gun and shoot, you know, they just, just this week had a terrorist come out of the tunnels and they caught them through the drones and they, you know, had a shoot out with them. Like he's felt that moment of close to death. So he's thinking like, Lorlene, God forbid, you know, what is, what do I want from my life? So, so well, that's one of the things the guys in the Intimacy Boys this year, with what type of people made, we really felt the seriousness of being in Israel and being part of a war situation especially when there was the missiles flying here and everyone was feeling it very first hand. Everyone suddenly woke up a different level of like what they want from their life. And it's not just about like the TikTok party lifestyle. Like it's, I had to get there myself in my own way and you're gonna do it your own way, no one can force it on you. But you get to a point where you just start to like make choices where you, relationship actually matters. And it's not just about that intense. And now to get to the crude thing and then we'll leave, leave it open for you guys. When you're with, a lady, and you're just about you and what pleasure you can get. So then you're just fulfilling your own needs. So that's another thing my sons work really hard, not to just fulfill his own needs. It's about actually connecting to another person and connecting to their needs. How can I, like real intimacy is pleasuring the lady, is actually making her feel good. That's real intimacy. Making myself feel good is not real intimacy. That's, you can do that yourself, you don't need her. Yeah, even though that's, you're not really allowed, but you can do it yourself. You don't need her because, you know, there's plenty of ways, you know, with technology coming, like what, what they're talking about, like futuristic stuff coming, it's like you could be married to a robot, you know? You don't even need a woman, yeah? Your phone, whatever. Yeah, you don't, you know, levels of whatever that will become. So now it's like, you know, I, this person, I can actually go on a journey with and connect and fill their soul feel that there's a human being, it, the pleasure is like 10x, 100x, a million x fold because it's with a, you're connecting on a soul level to another human being and you're experiencing something that's so beyond instead of that, just that feeling of release of pleasure. I mean, I don't know if you guys have, have, have had these intimate relationships, but after you're with a woman you don't really care about, it feels exciting before, but as soon as you've done the act, you don't even like them, unless you've had that feeling. You got what you wanted, I just want to get out of it. Yeah? I don't know if any of you guys have that feeling. Yeah. I mean, that just shows like what it is. If it's not with someone you really want to grow and develop with, 
you just want to get out of this space. Like, you did what you needed, you could have done it yourself, you didn't need her. Whereas when you're with your soulmate, it's a journey. And it, it continues, it grows, it gets better. Like, why is marriage so challenged nowadays? Because people aren't going on this journey. They're thinking elsewhere, there's someone else who can fulfill my needs more. Instead of, I'm growing on this journey with this other human being, how can we grow together? How can I pleasure her? How can I build her? How can she build me? And that's what she's thinking about. And then you, you're constantly getting a high level of intimacy. You're more open, <coughs> you're more trusting, you're more soulful. You know that there's a loyalty factor. You know that you're not just, like, it's not just one time thing. So that's like the, the contrast with that world, and that's what made a big impact to me. One of the things I did do is I held back a lot before I got, found my soul somewhere. And I think that opened me up to her. Like, meaning I made choices to not just play around in this area. Already by 17, 18, like, I had girls coming to university, and I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this. And, that, you know, 17, 18, 19, I was already like, at a point where I just thought I needed to just, I said to one girl, I said, she was like really serious. I said, if you want to connect, we're going to have to get married or something. We're going to have to go this full way, because I'm not doing it just whatever. And she, she was like, whoa, she like never met a guy who talk that way. You know, guys just want to get what they want. And like, you know. But I was like, hold, no, no, hold back. I need this to be the real thing or not at all. So I already came to that. And there was no rabbi brainwashing me. It wasn't like someone was like, my parents needed me to be that way. This was from my own personal journey with myself and my development. So now I open up, you guys. The focus is on two points, intimacy, how to get it quality and how to have a focused relationship. And I want you guys to ask as much as you want. Do you feel like the period you had yeah. before your 18, 19, when you decided like, no, I really want to connect with someone, the period you had before and this is the, the 16, 17, Party time, yeah. that type of time, do you feel like it was necessary for you to have that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, and do you regret any part of that at all leading up towards the... the wow. I'm, these are this is brilliant. I mean, he's really paid attention first, so respect, man. Where are you from? Melbourne. Melbourne. Okay, cool. You're a good listener, so I appreciate that. Um, you, like everything you ask and everything it means you really listen, and the questions are really spot on. Um, so for me, the way I see my life being, as they call it in the Jewish world, about tshuva, whatever they call it. The way I see it is that everything I did before was a part of my process of becoming who I am now. So I don't regret anything. I don't regret anything. From being by the holiest moments of my life to the most crazy, like Magaluf nightclub, crazy situation, like whatever those situations were, everything was a building. And I have to say, I felt closer to God sometimes in the more crazy places than I did sometimes in the more seemingly spiritual, holy places. And that's, for me, a very deep point. That you can find God, you can find yourself, you can find your intimacy in a very ho not holy place. And it's like, where did the, like, for example, with Shavuot, two days, we'll ask your questions to Zephyrus. Where did the Torah get given? It didn't get given in Jerusalem, and on the temple. Where did it get given? In the desert, surrounded by snakes and craziness, and nations who were doing crazy stuff. Where did we develop as a nation in Mitzrayim? Mitzrayim was like, whatever movie you can imagine, like where the most crazy scenes are going on. I don't, I don't want to maybe list any. Uh, what the back of my head, what can I think of? I mean, I'm not going to, the modern day stuff is crap. Like Netflix, excuse my language, but like sex education, that, that, uh, that whole series was rubbish. Like proper trash. Like by the end of it, it was like fantasy wokeism. I don't know what it was. Rubbish. Yeah. If you want to know, like, real, like, hardcore, like, basic instinct when I was a kid, that was a movie about intimacy the wrong way, yeah? Michael Douglas, he was just here the other day, actually, giving support to Israel, and Sharon Stone, I think she's somewhat supportive, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure. But that was a crazy movie about this, this issue, yeah? So that, that's when you start... Now, what I'm saying is that you have to understand that I can do tuba from that movie that I saw. I can understand the power that's in intimacy like it calls the name of it, basic instinct. It's such a basic instinct of humanity. But if you elevate it, if you bring it to a good place with your soulmate, and that's the only place you can do it, it gets, it, get, it brings you to the, the deepest, the most fulfilling places. It gives you a fulfillment, it gives you family, it gives you values, it gives you dedication. It's, it's like another different way of living than just whatever kind of life. So what are you gonna say? Did you have faith or 
believe in God or have a relationship with God during your yeah. body? Yeah, yeah, so that's what I said. Nightclub, I suddenly, you know, a few times. One nightclub I was in in London, it's like, it's like they called it the au pair nightclub, meaning it's like all the women who come from abroad to work for these uh, rich people, like my family, can work for them. And, it, you know, they come with the au pairs and you can find one of these, like, internationals, you know? Yeah. So I went to one of those clubs. And what was playing on the speakers? On the rivers of Babel. Yeah? Who's that by? Anyone know? Billy Joel. Yeah, Billy Joel. I'm old. So Billy Joel was playing, but it was like a remix or something, like a disco version, or a nightclub version. Yeah, it was like a remix of Billy Joel song. And I was like, well, wait a minute, I'm Jewish. Like, what? what? You know, I knew that much, you know, that that was a significant Jewish song, a Jewish concept from Psalms. And so that really affected me on, a, on an inner level that I was suddenly experiencing a Jewish moment in a nightclub. And I had a bunch of those. Like, I remember my ex-girlfriend, I call her my ex because she was probably the only girl like, I really was serious with before my wife. And my wife knows who she is and hates her, obviously, because yeah? um, they had some in interactions because I was still sort of at the end story when I first met my wife. And she was in a nightclub with me in this Spanish island. I've got loads of stories about that one. And she was singing a song, You're free, you gotta do what you got to do, let you live your life. It was like a big song in the 90s. And be what you got to be. And I suddenly felt like God was speaking through her, telling me that I'm better than this. I've got to live a better life than this. This is not my life. And it literally woke me up. It was scary how spiritually overwhelmed I felt in such a dark place. So, do you think... And no one brainwashed me to get like this. Like my, no one was feeding me Judas. It might sound like a foolish question, just to yeah. about that. Like it probably is a foolish question. Like were you yeah. sober those times? Yeah, no. Um, that night, probably, I drank quite a bit, I reckon. Had a you few times. Influence over the spiritual Look, there's definitely, I would say, all the drugs and alcohol I did were tools to help. By the way, whoever leaves, uh, there will be a recording on it. You can listen. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned. It. Have a good one. Thanks for being here. So that's El Nishama or something. What's his name? Yeah. Oh, some guy. Nishama's on Madrid. Oh, that was cool. Good name. Anyway, so um, what was I saying? To get back to the flow. So um, yeah. So I would once again. I said no regrets. So I needed that time of drugs and alcohol at that time of my life to get me out of the. You know. I don't know if you know the radio song, OK Computer, but like, you know, 9 to 5 in the gym, like robot-style lifestyle. I needed something to break me out and make me think a little bit out of the box, <coughs> open me up to the soul a little bit. But would I say everyone needs to do that to get spiritual? No. But for me, at that time in my life, I was so like boxed into a London, northwest sort of lifestyle where you do this and do this, and it's all like written out for you, that I needed some way to sort of escape it. And the alcohol and the drugs was like a stepping stone. I wouldn't say it was necessary for everyone, but for me at that time, it gave me a sensitivity to, to think, think and be more creative and think a little bit out of the box, so that once I came to Israel, I actually quit from all of it, because I felt such a creative energy here, I didn't need that anymore. Do you think having a relationship with God helps your relationship with your wife? Yeah, for sure. Like, my friend back then said, he's either going to be a gangster or some religious fanatic. That was like the joke, yeah? Like, I was running a nightclub who actually were owned by gangsters, yeah? So I just had that mentality that was a bit more like overly networking, overly in the business, overly... In, so it had to be focused, and the only way I could get grounded was a higher power, as they say. Like, the whole 12 steps thing. The only way you can control these addictions is through a higher power. You need a higher power to ground you, to, to make you realise you're not enslaved to all these drives. So you don't have to always... So, yeah, so to be a loyal husband, I needed, I needed a higher power to remind me that I have a commitment to that. And that relationship with God is, and it's also on a deep level, the relationship with God, relationship with wife, relationship, it's all connected. It's, it all becomes one. Question. Yeah, what do you want to say? That was a good question. Yeah. Uh, what is your wife? What is your religion? My wife grew up South African, and if you know South Africans, because some of you guys are, they're very traditional. I don't know what it's like now, but she went to Herzliya, for example, and she got a very like, Jewish education. She was way ahead of me in that sense. She knew how to read Hebrew properly, and she was way ahead of like in traditions and, and understanding values. Like they were more like not too far off from their European ancestors. 
who had a lot of traditions, whereas my family, more generations in London, had already given up a lot of any connection to Judaism. And, you know, they got involved with reform already, whereas in South Africa there wasn't really reform. And, you know, the, the, it was much more traditional. So she, and she actually really bloomed, like she really flowered when she got involved with Jewish stuff at school. But there was a famous Rebison back then who came to visit, and being in Jaffa, she went to a Jewish school. I went to a public school. So it was a very different... So she had all those Jewish experiences that I had. And so her teachers always felt like she was going to become more... She always had that potential. And she really pushed me when we became one to really go down with more very religious. We were like very religious at one point in our journey, like in the external sense. And now we feel like we've really done tshuva on the tshuva. Like you have to now balance out, like our friend here asked before, the past with the future, with the present, get everything more organic and together. And that's where I feel like we're at now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, you said that you kind of came to the decision, like by yourself, yeah. that you wanted to become more religious and kind of leave the rest of it behind. Sure. Uh, did you all, anyone in your family, your parents, like influence you in a way? They, my family were more against it. Huh? Can I go to the toilet real quick? Sure, you can do whatever you need, man. You're good. Please come back. Yeah. The idea, no, idea of uh, my family, they, they were against it. Like, they were brought up with like the English sort of cynicalism. They're like the rabbi, the rabbinate are corrupt and you know, they just want power, that kind of headspace. You know? So Judaism has presented me as some sort of like snoring rabbi experience, you know? So I had to really w work on myself, to believe in myself, when my own parents weren't supportive initially. They still have issues with it, but they, they, uh, they see a lot of the good that's come out of it. You know? It's grounded me, I've got beautiful children, you know, like, I'm very focused. You know, my son's a hero in Israel, which he wouldn't be if he grew up in London, you know? There's a lot of pluses, yeah. Uh, when you were 18, 19, you came to Israel, what did you do? Yeah, yeah, so I came, at first I came, sure. I came um, by myself, just like hippie style, ended up in Svart, smoked a lot of weed initially. And that was actually a big change point, because I was, one, I didn't hook up with women, which was a miracle back then. I, I just didn't, <clears throat> I showed some pictures from then, you'll see why I was, girls were interested, but I just didn't, and... <laughs> No, I just didn't. Um, but I did smoke a lot. But then I started, someone challenged me and said, you know, you can get high without the smoking, without the women, and without, without the uh, need to, like, you know, break, you know, connect to everyone, like, drive around. You can have Shabbat. You can get high off Shabbat. So that was, once I experienced that, that, that really blew me away. Um, that was in Sfat. When I came to Shalim, I had a lot of very powerful experiences in Jerusalem, by the Kotel, and with other people around. And then when um, I ended up by, uh, by back in London working in a factory for my father, his, my father's factory, and that was really not spiritual, but there was a Jewish program nearby called the Jelly. I started going there, and they sort of, their whole thing was to push me to come back to Israel and go to Awesomeh, which is like this Baal Shubi Yeshiva in Jerusalem. And I don't know, you have it in South Africa, Awesome students or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have also Awesomeh, you have also Awesome as well. So whatever the new version of it is for young guys. So um, I ended up like with that experience, the Shiva experience. But I, I part of me wanted to go Chabad, part of me wanted to like just float around. But I ended up there because my wife's twin brother went there, and we were very close. And I connected to some rabbis, some souls there in a deeper way than I was with other places. And they became very, you know, big part of my life. And my wife went to a seminary which was similar to that, called the um, Neve. So it's like they sort of go together. So it was like we ended up in the right place, the right time, with the right people, and it helped me get to that point where then I could go on a spiritual journey with her. And we were at the same, somewhat at the same, same space. That's also very important. You, you're sharing the journey somewhat with the person you're with. There should be some common ground in terms of your spiritual journey as well. Like we, we bonded in that way. Yeah. Um, based on what your past ended like, I'm sure you had a lot of female friends when you decided sure. to um, sure. go on a path towards like, someone you love and yeah. find a soulmate in that sense. They were still around, yeah, some yeah. of those girls. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on maintaining a very 
close relationship with the female while you're married or in a serious way? So, I ha what happened was to me, like, for me, it was, a lot of those relationships were sexual. Yeah? So, to just, like, what was unusual about my wife was it wasn't. That was the unique thing. I was like bonding with this person, but she was actually upset about it. Like one of the stories was we went to see uh, Titanic. Now Titanic's like a romance. So I went there and I was sitting next to her. I had all these boys behind who we used to actually have fights with, funny enough. We were all sitting there behind going, eh, like sticking their tongues out, like kind of pretending like we're going to kiss or something. And we actually didn't. And when I went back, drop her off at her house, like people were like, wow, these two look really good together. I dropped her off and I wrote item. And I went to get the seatbelt to help her get out because it got stuck. She thought that was the moment, and I said, I'm just getting the seatbelt. And she never, she wrote that in her diary, I actually saw it once. I'm just getting the seatbelt, that was the lie, you know? I'm just getting the seatbelt. Because why didn't I move in on it? Something was stopping me, I just felt like I needed to have more of a connection with her than just the physical. I'd like done that already. And all the girls I'd been physical with, you know, it didn't feel like it was that deep. It was more that they were pretty or whatever. And, um, when I came here, so there were situations where they did reconnect, but like one or two older friends, like role models of mine, at that time were like, better to stay away. You know, I'll bring them, I'll open them up to this beautiful pass, path that I'm on, and they were like, you're not going to do that. You're going to end up falling. You know, it's not going to work. So for me, it wasn't that, because I was a very sexually active guy, it probably wasn't wise for me to do that. Like, I went to work in a rehab and in Israel called Retorna, and I worked with a lot of the guys, and once in a while they made me work with the women, and I just felt like this isn't my thing. Like, generally my focus has always been, I've worked in many programs over the years, guys. I just, girls, not my, you know, I have my badge in them. That's me, me personally, you have to know yourself, you know? Like, um, not that I'm going to jump on anyone and do something crazy, but just, you have to know yourself. And uh, generally my success has been like, with, 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 the, with the young men, not so much with the young women. And that includes my old girlfriends. I mean, I'm very close with my boys. Yeah? I went back to one of their weddings, and at the end of the wedding, everyone was drunk. It was in London, and even one of my famous family members was there, a guy called Harvey Goldsmith. And this, this uh, ginger girl that I was never really into, but she was into me, came up to me and said, come on, let's dance. Yeah? She wanted to like, you know, I said, look, I've got a wife, I, I think then I had five kids waiting for me back home in Jerusalem. Like, it's not happening, you know, it's just not happening. No one would have cared there, because it was a secular crowd, no one would have cared. But I was not having boundaries, and I didn't, you know, I didn't dance, and I feel good about it. Then afterwards, I went back to my friend's place, who's living in Marlboro, and it's a fancy part of London, and, and I said to him, I bro, like, we played a game of chess. I said, if I win, you get rid of the non Jewish girlfriend, you know, and he's a clever guy, good at chess. Well, God was on my side, I beat him. Years later, I went to meet with him in, in, in another place, he flew me in, and I got a bit of on him, and we had a whole fight about again, about the non-Jewish girlfriend, and Baruch Hashem now, all these years later, about four years or so, I got involved with his wedding, and it was a beautiful Jewish wedding, and a beautiful Jewish wife, and he just had a Jewish baby. I, I invested in my relationships with my friends, and thank God, you know, they're, Jewish-wise, they're alive, you know, all of them, thank God. Yeah. You've had quite a few relationships. Um, how do you know when you found the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with? Like what, what that kind of shifts? I mean, you, how, how do you. Did you were there when I mentioned the park situation? Exactly. And I felt that with the guitar, and she was writing oh, poetry. Sorry, I, I came all the yeah, so I was talking about it. Like, it was this moment of. It's a good question, but I did sort of cover it, but maybe I need to clarify it. It was a moment of deep clarity, of, like, where I felt like we'd had a previous life experience. Like there was something about this person that was much deeper than any other person I've ever encountered. Like a soul moment. I had, you had to be a little bit open for it, to experience that, but it does happen. I don't know if you've ever had that. Where you meet someone, and in your trip to Israel, you met someone on this trip who you just really bonded. You could just talk, you could just connect. There's so much common ground. So when you have this with a lady, and she's not irritating, she's actually deep, you actually want to talk more, you know, because I, I don't mean to be rude, but sometimes women, that's another thing, I always tell my kids, I've got a bunch of teenager boys, they're all good looking, in my opinion, yeah, so, like, they, the girls, you know, they hit them up, you know, on IG, or whatever, one of them, thank God, got off IG, because of it, yeah, and 
And one of my boys, he said he's already found the girl that he's interested in. He's 16, he just flew himself to, to, to Poland and Ukraine. He works, he has his own job, but he's, he's a manager of a store, and he flew himself off. He's there now, he's in, he's in the Ukraine, he's going to be there for Shavuot. And uh, he's already said he's found the girl that he's like gonna. He's just waiting. Like he's not. I'm not ready. She's not ready. You know, his brothers are a bit big. Just wait till like he's at a place where it's ready to, to see if it's. And until then, he's not interested. And the in any other one. And the other other boy himself, like he he's I the one who is a bit maybe more likely to do that kind of thing. I we've hit up a girl. So I said to him. Just want to let you know how irritating a woman can be if she's not the one. I don't know if you've had that experience. I don't mean to be rude about women. But you yeah. get... Yeah, yeah, and they need, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they this and that. Now, if it's your wife, if it's your soulmate, there's, there's all these pluses as well. But now you're probably not getting much. Yeah. By the way, secular people, it's good to know this, good, good percentage. Most secular people don't get much, as you should know from their marriage. That's one of the reasons why most of them break it up. I mean, apparently the percentages are like once every six months. Imagine, you've married this woman. I'm not joking, go look it up. Most, most secular people now are hardly getting, having any sex with their wife. At a certain point, it just stops happening. So then what happens? Divorce, or they cheat, or this and that. The marriage is not, it's not bonding. They're not bonding, they're not going on this journey I mentioned before. Whereas in a, a kosher Jewish marriage, you're minimum two times a week probably. Based on the way the schedule is with mikvah and everything else, and you know, and then four times a month at least, and then at the beginning, and when there's energy, it could be more, and you know, and and then as you get you get to a point where you don't need to only connect intimately to connect, it could be just a touch, it could be just a look in the eyes, it could be a a, a very deep conversation, and it does all the stuff that intimacy supposedly does. You start to understand that intimacy isn't just the act of sex is it's actual an emotional bonding which is apparently 90 percent of the whole connection 10 percent is physical and now if you add the soul level the soul spiritual aspects which the therapists aren't going to talk about so much but the idea you have a spiritual connection that's also a huge part where you feel like it's it's a bonding experience you know i have a, a podcast relationship flow you have to like create a whole experience for it to really grow and to become something that you want to do and she wants to do and you're in the mood and it's, you're going to make time for it and it's special. Unlike that world, after some point, people are just finding other ways to be stimulated. Yeah? So that's really sad out there. I feel sorry for those husbands and men, for those women. who are not really bonding anymore. <coughs> so I knew that you're getting the best out of the relationship between man and wife through doing it the right way. And understanding the depth of it, you know, there's Kabbalah, there's, there's mysticism, there's, there's deep aspects to, to, to it's, it's holy, it's, it's, it's the highest thing, you know? it's the highest way of, of unification, it's the highest way of unifying what another thing be. And if we know that reality is, it's the most challenged part of human reality. Any more questions before we end off? Got a few more minutes? Come on, you guys are really... What's the easy thing about... No, no, ask. I want to hear the most crazy thing. Oh, think about having like, sex twice a week when you're married. So that's like the Torah, like, you know, Friday night, mikvah, like, if you want to get into the religion aspect, there's a whole religious side to it, yeah? So you go to the, to the purity, purification process, and so the night of the of purification process, the mikvah night, and then there's the Shabbat night, and then, you know, the idea that you shouldn't overdo it, so then, and just reality is a woman might has a lot of hormones, a lot of interest, the beginning part, and then the second week she's already starting to feel hormonal and not be so in the mood anyway. Remember, a woman, that's another thing, like, you have to, like, learn to study women a little bit, their process. Like, they're not just, like, like the way the movies make. They're always, in, they're always up for it. They always look great and they're always up for it. They wake up in the morning, perfect, yeah? And they're in the mood, always. That's how the movies make. So there's no such reality. That's either a prostitute or a porn star. There's no such reality. Yeah? And even she's going to have a limit, yeah? because there's only hurt so much. So the point is, there's no such reality. A woman is a process. It's, you have to get to know their cycle, their flow, their, person, their emotional state. It's a process. That's why I say, when it's in marriage, you can start to work it out. But when it's just the hitting up a woman, like, 
you know, you're not going to know what's going on if you're not in a real relationship. You're just going to be confused half the time. Why is she in such a bad mood? Why is she so not responsive? You know, I don't get it. You were so physical, now she just wants distance. I don't get it. All this confusion that goes on. Yeah, what do you want to ask? You want to ask something? Someone want to ask? No, no, no. Questions. I want more questions. So, so what do you think keeps like, that spark alive in religious families? Looking at, I think that in contrast to a secular marriage, you know, Not all religious families are getting yeah, it out, right? No, I'm sure, but let me say the, the, yeah. if you look at the statistics, I'm sure the religious marriage would probably be, be getting more action there. <laughs> <laughs> Not just action, like bonding. Okay. Yeah. Bonding more yeah. on that spiritual level and physical level than the secular family. What yeah. do you think? Well, look, if you're not bringing Netflix to the bedroom, that's already a head start, yeah? Because, you know... Bye, bye. Yeah, bye. you've got times of disconnecting to reconnect. That's the famous concept of Shabbat. Even though anyone out there in high-tech really needs to do this, anyone in the big business world needs to just disconnect to reconnect, needs to just turn off. I was with a secular guy from Tel Aviv this last week, a big, big high-up business guy, and he said to me, I'm not religious, but Shabbat, I disconnect to reconnect. I mean, he, he first I disconnect. So I said, and why did you disconnect? To reconnect. I added to that point. And he said, you're right, reconnect to my wife, to my kids, my grandchildren. Like he's an older guy and he knows the importance of it, even not being religious and not being, you know, interest, interested in the laws of Shabbat. But the concept, he gets it. And that's so, so too with a woman. Yeah? You didn't ask any questions, man. I'm sorry. Ask one question. How and then you can go. Huh? How are you? How am I doing? Yeah. I'm enjoying this. I'd love to come back and do this again, but you guys are doing this a long time thing. We'll love you guys. We'll love you guys. Oh, yeah, you can ask. Ask Shmulafai. You know Shmulafai? He's the guy who organizes. Yeah. You want to thank anyone? Thanks for coming. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, could you like, say the stories about your experience in Spain? Of course. We'll end off with the Spain story. I did do one when you are free, you got to live. You got to do. So there was another story. This story I don't tell everyone. I went into a club, and I'm, I was on the rebound from this relationship, and she had already was starting to hook up with some other dude, yeah? And while we were still connected, and by that point I'd already met my wife-to-be, so I was getting, shift, things were shifting. And the girl, guy she'd always wanted, she'd hooked up with, in fact, she'd hooked up with him already in front of me at um, another crazy nightclub in, in London, in a dress that I just bought her, very expensive dress. And I just met all her family. And she, in front of me, I, I mean, I was very busy with my boys in the slot machines. So while I turned my back, she was off with this dude. Yeah? And I even drove her home. That's how crazy I was. So, why are like that? so this, the next story, I was at in Spain and all his boys were there. Yeah? He wasn't there, but you know, me and the boys are the same thing. Yeah? So I was going to, and I had like the, the drink and the feeling like I could do it. They were older than me, so it was a bit, you know, they were tougher guys, but I was going to do it. But I thought, you know what, I'm, she was there with, the, with his boys, yeah? and my ex. So I saw this girl there, and she, I call them club women, club boys. I don't know what the name is in the street name, because it's been so long. But they're the women of the clubs. Like the women literally, sorry, the clubs bring these kind of women, like they like promoters. finance them, promote them to promote the club. And they're like all done up to the nines, as they say. And you know, they've got you know, everything, the extensions, everything. And that one of those women, I was like, you know, I started hitting on her, but drink this, that. Anyway, I was trying to do it to make my ex jealous, yeah? So it didn't work so much, but there was a bit of roughness between us and the boys. It did, you know, we ended up leaving it. My, boy, my own boys were good boys. They were like, let's just get out of here and have a good time. Let's enjoy this holiday, forget her. It's not a waste of time, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, later on, I'm walking around the town. I've lost all my boys. I don't even know. So I'm just come to this place, I'm drunk with my head, I don't know where I'm at. So I walk into a cafe, and the girl from the club girl was sitting there. And she, she liked me, she liked my vibe back then. She said, come, come sit down. So I sat down, you know, we started talking, and then, you know, it was going on another like, hour or so, and then she said, come back to my place. And I was like, ooh, you know, two in the morning, let's go. So I come back to her place, I get there, she starts taking off all this stuff. Because remember, she dressed like extensions, and. I'm getting a little bit freaky. She's not as tall as she looks suddenly, you know? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Thank God. Before those days, when generally those things would happen. Thank God. Thank you. I never had that experience, thank God. 
you. So that, that would be more like 2024 experience, you know? That you know really nowadays, it's got to be such a shame to from that kind of shock. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway so, but, I'm angry, I'm angry. No, but you need protection because you don't know. So like, What's anyway, so like, <coughs> I mean, I don't know if you've seen some of the women out there, they look like the hottest women with, you know, and below is completely not. So anyway, so um, she, she took it all off and then we'd, she said, come, come, you know, come, you know, sleep. So come, come. So I come and we start talking and talking and talking. She says to me, like, by the end of all the talking, she's like, because obviously she had a lot of trauma from her past relationships in Wales and wherever she was from and all the different things she was going through. And I, all I cared about was this previous relationship. And I, I got to a point where I just, I just felt like, if it, once again, as I said in university, if it wasn't the real thing, I can't do it. I can't go through this pain that I was going through for this ex. The fire, like it says, we'll add in a bit of Torah here, Ish for Isha. Ish for Isha is a man and woman in Hebrew. It has in it the same letters as Ish, as fire. Yeah, both Ish and Isha, both have fire. What's the two letters that's the difference between the woman and man? The Yud. And a hey. Yud and hey together make what? God. Shina. Yika. Yeah. However you want to say it. Yeah? So Yud and K to come together and make God's name. We want to unite God's name in this world. We want to be light to the world. So when each and each come together, if they've got God's blessing, if they're together with on a soul level, there's a unification going on. So then it has the the fire gets the energy, that fire elevates relationship. What I experienced from that X was how much that fire burnt. I felt the burn. I don't know if you've ever broken up with a girl who you really like. It's a burn. It's fire. Fire gone wrong. Divorces, they're like fire. Fire's in their house. But they hate each other. Passion, most divorces. Yeah? They end up trying to destroy each other. It's like this burning fire, consuming fire. Instead of what? The fire's contained, controlled, channeled, and it's passionate. It's great. It's, it lights up the home, it brings warmth, it brings souls, it brings more souls to the world, it brings light to the world. You can now, as a unit, do so much more. That's Ish for Isha, but we did not care. That's with God's blessing. So that was the contrast with the Spanish experience, the Spanish island experience, because she was not getting that from her lifestyle, obviously, and I wasn't getting it from my ex. So all we did was just bond, how we both, and she asked me, cuddle me. I didn't do anything else in cuddle. So when I went back to my boys after that night, they were all like, oh, you know, like three, four in the morning, four, four, five in the morning. Like, I didn't stay there. I didn't end up sleeping. I just left after an hour, cuddling And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were just, you know, we saw who you were with, you know. Uh-huh. And I was like, no, nothing happened, man. Nothing. I, I'm still working out this X story. That I just, not, not where I'm at. And that's gradually, gradually what helped me open up to a more spiritual relationship, understanding that fire. I just didn't want to have that that negative experience of seemingly at the beginning all this passion, but now it turns into fire gone wrong. And that, that for me was a big like a wake up call. So I'm happy to come back and do a bit more because we really only touched, I did like 20 sessions with the previous group. Um, that's up to you guys, you let, let Schmaller fly, I don't know how much more time you're here. But I really appreciated the attendance, I appreciated the, the listening, the questions. I hope the answers were helpful and I know that by discussing this kind of stuff, because it's very real, we didn't even get into the whole sex thing and phone stuff that goes on and, you know, we didn't get into that. Like, the way the phones have such an impact now on relationships, the lack of focus, the status, the fakeness, you know, we didn't even get into that. Like, the whole phone experience, like, with women nowadays, because it is a whole nother level that you guys have to do with it. I didn't have to do with it. Man. And, uh, you know, that, just understand, anything you're tested in, if your test is that much harder to really come out with a good relationship, you actually, if you can get it right, or and even if you don't get it right completely, but at least trying, that's a big accomplishment also. And that's how God looks at us in this generation. He's really looking for us, really trying hard to just get that relationship right. He sees how our, our intentions and our will, our, our inner will is to do the right thing by, by our, our own way of doing, dealing with this process, with how we... Every time we hold back from not watching porn or not texting that girl that we shouldn't or not hooking up when we shouldn't, every time we hold back a little bit and then when we please God find the right person and really dedicate ourselves, like to really dedicate and not to end up as another statistic of divorce 
and single parent families and all that stuff that's going on. And it, it takes a lot of work and it, it's worth it. If this is something worth investing in and that's why it's important to have these kind of conversations because it will lead you guys to have intimate scene that will be focused on quality. That's it. Uh, yeah. Okay, much love. Come again, as they say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your time here, guys. Can we see some photos?